And I think it's particularly appropriate that I talk about uh, rotary cuff repair past, present, and future in this Arthrex venue because much of the history of arthroscopic cuff repair is the history of Arthrex. Technology is not kind. It does not say, are you ready yet? In fact, technolo technology is born ugly. And some of these ugly early technologies can grow and mature into be being very beautiful, advanced, and sleek technologies after a time. But humans find security in the routine. Patients would like to be able to say, my surgeon has done this operation thousands of times. And the surgeon would like to be able to reassure his patients by saying, yes, I've done this operation thousands of times. But we can't really have that luxury because we live in this information age of technology now. In 1950, the doubling time of all human information was 10 years. In 2004, the doubling time was 18 months. Now the doubling time is less than a year. So with change occurring that rapidly, we really have only two choices. We can either totally try to resist change and try to go back a few decades if we wanted to do that, probably not practical, or we can ride that rocket of change and we can embrace the change and embrace, embrace the new technology. I would like to think that we might embrace that new technology with the, th the same enthusiasm that uh, Commander Alan Shepard had when he became the first American launched into space in 1962. As he sat alone in that Mercury capsule at the top of that redstone rocket on Cape Canaveral, he really couldn't contain his unbridled enthusiasm for the frontier he was about to cross. And as mission control counted down, Commander Shepard said, let's light this candle. Surgeons are fond of using the term paradigm shift. It's a very deceptive term because uh, the, the, the idea of paradigm shift is actually quite disruptive. It's not gentle at all. Um, we'd like to think that perhaps we'd ride the gentle waves of change from one technology to the next, but nothing could be further from the truth. The term disruptive technology was coined by Clayton Christensen, who is a professor of business at Harvard Business School. Uh, he coined that term in this book, The Innovator's Dilemma, 15 years ago when he published this book. And in that book, he highlighted two ways that technological change can occur. He used the computer industry as an example. And the first way that we have this technological change is enhancement technology. In the 1970s, IBM was the undisputed world leader in computer technology. They had these massive mainframe computers that all the major corporations bought. They had, the, their clientele was the major corporations of the entire world. And every few years, they would enhance their hardware and their software. They would sell them to these big companies, and they would be grateful. And this was what was called enhancement technology. And it left very little room for computers, or, or very little room for competitors. At least, that's what the IBM people thought. Uh, there was still that market for small personal computers, but um, IBM didn't think it was necessary or even appropriate for them to go after it because it was a very low margin field. It wouldn't offer them much profit. They had all the major, um, all the major uh, clients already. But there were other small startup companies out there like Microsoft and Apple and Intel, and they thought it would be worthwhile to take the risk and the effort to develop this new technology, which meant developing additional technologies like miniaturization, microprocessors, and even to be able to interface with another brand new technology, the internet. And so they were able to do this below the radar and develop a competing technology to this mainframe technology that IBM had. So out of uh, view of IBM, they developed this technology that totally overwhelmed IBM in what seemed like an instant. And by the time IBM recognized that they were no longer uh, the leader, it was too late. They were, they were behind this uh, new technology for personal computers. So this is what we would call a disruptive technology. There's a lot of disruptive technology in our future. It will continue to be developed even faster. Um, but before we look into the future, I think it's always instructive to look to the past. The further backward you look, the further forward you can see. Winston Churchill. <laughs> 
As I said, technology is not kind, but it is born ugly, simple, and ignorant. And it's no wonder, when you start from nothing, the early things have to be simple. Um, let's look at paradigm shifts in the history of shoulder surgery. Probably the earliest paradigm shift that's recorded, it was 3,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. Uh, it was recorded um, with some figures that showed what looks like a modified coker maneuver to reduce an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. It doesn't sound like much, but it was a huge step forward in which a simple human intervention could totally change the future life of a patient who would have been totally disabled had this intervention not taken place. Not much else happened for another 15 years, or 1,500 years, excuse me. Uh, in 500 uh, BC, Hippocrates related his experience with using a hot iron to create eschars in the axilla and thereby stabilizing shoulders that were chronic dislocators. This was probably the first minimally invasive procedure. It wasn't surgery, but it was close, and he used his knowledge of anatomy to be able to avoid any permanent uh, disabilities in these people. I'm proud to report that the first shoulder surgery in North America took place in what is now Texas. Um, in 1535, Cabeza de Vaca um, performed this surgery. Cabeza de Vaca had been a Spanish explorer who was shipwrecked off the coast of Texas in 1528. He was captured by the Humano Indians, who were actually cannibals, but he convinced them not to uh, kill him by telling them he was a healer. They believed him, and he began to treat them with poultices and herbs and developed quite a reputation as a healer. In 1535, the Indians brought to him a young warrior that had been injured by an arrow that had penetrated through his shoulder and lodged in the chest wall. Cabeza de Vaca removed the uh, arrow from the chest wall. He uh, removed the shaft from the shoulder, and then he closed these wounds using some hair from an animal hide and using a deer bone as a needle to sew these up. The warrior made an uneventful recovery, and this enhanced Cabeza de Vaca's reputation even more as a healer, and it assured that the Indians were never going to let him go. Uh, he did escape, though, 15 years later and returned to Spain and was able to relate his adventures, and that's why we know about these various things, although they may be somewhat exaggerated. In the 1830s and 1840s in Europe, before the, de the development of inhalation anesthesia, um, the man who is generally recognized as the best surgeon in the world was the British surgeon Robert Liston, who practiced at University College in, Yon in London. Liston felt that speed was the absolute most important thing in surgery because, of course, there was no anesthesia. And he was reputed to be able to do a major amputation in less than three minutes. Um, he became so famous that he had visitors from all over the world to come and watch him operate and learn his secrets. The problem was that uh, Professor Liston sometimes amputated more than he intended. There was one amputation in which he not only amputated the leg, but performed an accidental orchiectomy at the same time. Another operation resulted in the death of three people in the operating room. One of the visiting surgeons stood too close when the, uh, when the amputation knife came down, and he died of a slash wound. The patient died three days later of overwhelming sepsis, and uh, Liston's assistant, who lost several fingers in the operation, developed an overwhelming infection and died as well. So speed wasn't everything, but Liston would never believe that. Even when, an when uh, anesthesia was developed in the 1850s, he refused to change over to general anesthetic, saying that it wasn't necessary for someone who is fast. Liston was a great example of someone who failed to adapt to change, and he rapidly retreated into oblivion. So, around 1850, we saw the development of ether anesthesia, and this allowed for the next great paradigm shift in all surgery, and that was the ability to do longer surgeries while the patient was asleep. Um, speed was still important for, because of, it was related to things like infection, but still, you could perform these more intricate, longer surgeries. The problem was that in those days, it was before the invention of the electric light bulb, and ether anesthesia was very flammable. In the operating room, surgeons used uh, lanterns with an open flame for light. So obviously that was a bad combination, and there were lots of explosions in the operating room. 
This became such a problem that in areas of the United States, for example in Texas, doctors resorted to a different strategy. The two most famous doctors in Texas in the mid-1800s were in San Antonio, and they were Dr. Ferdinand Herf and Dr. George Couples. Because of the flammability of ether, they decided to operate outdoors for most of their cases, and that avoid, avoided the flammability uh, problem. They would operate on sunny days where they had plenty of uh, visualization, on days that were not windy because you didn't want to have a lot of dust blowing in the, in the wound. The other thing that they did, which was way ahead of their time, was they boiled water for use in surgery. Before that, uh, simple water from the creek was what was used, and uh, obviously contamination was a great problem. So with this problem, um, you'd think, what would be the ultimate solution? And the ultimate solution was the invention of the electric light bulb. So when you think, what was the next paradigm shift or the paradigm technology that allowed surgery to advance, it was the invention of the electric light bulb. So in the most general way, Thomas Edison, the inventor of the electric light bulb, I think was actually the father of modern surgery. Some people might disagree with that and they say, well, he was not a surgeon, he was not even a physician or a biologist, how could he be the father of modern surgery? But this continued to be a problem for many years. Lippmann Kessel, who operated during uh, World War II, he served in the British Army as a, as a surgeon. And in those, in those conditions, they had to use lanterns once again. And he talked about uh, resorting to chloroform because he had experienced explosions in an operating tent in Tunisia. And this is a fascinating book of Lippmann Kessel's memoirs from World War II, if you're interested in reading it, Surgeon at Arms. So thank you, Thomas Edison, for taking the surgeon out of the cow pasture and putting him into the operating room. So now that surgery could actually be done, longer surgeries, there was a proliferation of reports of successful shoulder surgeries. Codman reported on his results of rotator cuff repair. Uh, Bankart reported on his instability repairs. Here in France, uh, this was later, but Latterge, about with his operation for instability. But the next great paradigm shift to occur was that of arthroplasty of the shoulder. The man who really popularized arthroplasty was Charles Neer of New York. And uh, although this was a paradigm shift, it wasn't truly a global paradigm shift because it was still open surgery. It was done with scalpels, with osteotomes, with the standard bone instruments. The next great global uh, paradigm shift occurred under the radar, as all great paradigm shifts do, and it came in the form of an innocent-looking little instrument, the arthroscope. Um, at the time, when it came over in the 1960s, uh, and Dr. Bob Jackson started to use it, it was considered only a diagnostic instrument and perhaps not even a very good one at that. In fact, at the Mayo Clinic, its use was relegated to the rheumatologists. It was beneath the level of the surgeons to even do arthroscopy. But uh, it did develop out of the uh, view of the, uh, of the halls of influence. And that actually was a good thing because when it finally did emerge, there was quite a bit of conflict from the experts of the day. And it was held with in more than just a little bit of disdain. But that disdain in the halls of academic uh, orthopedics would not last. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Mahatma Gandhi. So when you look at uh, change in science or change in medicine, this is a very instructive book to read. This is uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. It was written in the early 1960s. Thomas Kuhn was the man who coined the phrase paradigm shift. And um, he made the observation that most paradigm shifts in science are brought about by either very young individuals in that field are individuals who have not in, been in that field for a very long period of time. They're basically outsiders who are so naive that they don't know any better than to buck the establishment. If you doubt the truth of that uh, observation, then think about the 26-year-old clerk in the Swiss patent office who uh, published his theory of special relativity in 1905. Albert Einstein was such an outsider, he couldn't even get a job in academia. He could not get a job as a professor of physics.
No one knew who he was when he published this uh, theory, and no one believed him. They said that these equations were worthless and uh, that he was basically nobody, even though they did get published in, in uh, the esteemed journal Science. So Einstein had to stand alone as a very initially naive young man. The naivety didn't uh, last for long as he saw how cruel other people could be to him. But eventually, his theories were proven and upheld and, um, and became the, the standard for physics. In much the same way, some of the early, most of the early arthroscopists, in the United States at least, were young men in their 30s and 40s who were in private practice. They didn't have academic appointments. They didn't have anything to lose by bucking the establishment. Um, and in that way, they were able to uh, develop this, uh, this new technology out of the side of the establishment. Kuhn went on to say, if, on the other hand, no one reacted to anomalies or to brand new theories in high-risk ways, there would be few or no scientific revolutions. So the fact is that uh, these shoulder arthroscopists did embrace these high-risk uh, technologies, and in so doing, they assured their status as pariahs for the years to come, but that, uh, that status would not last. Don't raise your voice, improve your argument, Desmond Tutu. So Kuhn also observed that rather than a single group conversion, what occurs is an increasing shift in the distribution of professional allegiances. You're not going to shift everyone all at once, you're going to shift a few at a time. And that's how these paradigm shifts work. But the surgeons that did embrace this technology became rapidly amazed at how much you could see. You no longer had this keyhole incision in the shoulder where you had to just try to see as best you could. You had no spatial limits on what you could see. You could see the entire shoulder. You could also see things you didn't see before. You could see undersurface tears of the rotator cuff. People began to realize there were a lot more subscapularis tears than we thought before. There were postal lesions that could be repaired and understood. In addition, the rate of complications was much lower. In the Isikos registry that was reported in the year 2000, there were 60,000 cases of shoulder arthroscopy with four infections for an infection rate of one in 15,000 for shoulder arthroscopy. If you compare that to the open papers of that time period they, that were reporting about a 1% infection rate, you see that this is a huge advantage of arthroscopy over open rotator cuff repair. But the biggest thing, of course, that caused the paradigm shift was the patient demand. Patients uh, who, were, who had this surgery were generally satisfied. They told their friends, their family, and it, it spread like wildfire through the communities, and pretty soon it, the people that weren't doing or offering arthroscopic um, rotator cuff repair were not able to get very many patients. So how do paradigm shifts occur? We need to look at history versus mythology. So let's define these things. Our history tells us who we are, our mythology tells us who we hope to be. In the United States, we weren't burdened with such a long history as other parts of the world, so I think that gave us some freedom to develop more of a mythology. And one of our mythical heroes that uh, we have uh, really embraced over the years has been the cowboy, and per on a personal basis I've done that as well. The cowboy was the hero that talked slow, he rode fast, he shot straight, and he was the type of person who could generally be relied on to do what he said. In our professional lives, we have a mythology as well. We all have role models, mentors that we want to be like. This was my personal mentor, Dr. Mark Coventry at the Mayo Clinic from uh, residency that uh, I wanted to be like. I, I uh, felt that he was the type of person that I wanted to be. So if you want to achieve a paradigm shift in medicine, you've got to build a new mythology which has to be based on hypotheses, and then you've got to do some bench work to show that these concepts, these procedures, these instruments are actually going to work. So you have a lot of work ahead of you if you think you're going to achieve a paradigm shift. So let's see how that works. Well, you've got to incorporate change for the better, and you've got to prove to people that this new technology is going to be better than the old technology. So you've got to show, for example, with arthroscopic surgery, that the results are going to be equal to or better than those of open surgery. This requires a scientific rationale and scientific proof for changing the status quo. 
and you've got to prove then that these new surgical constructs are as strong as or stronger than the old ones. I have an engineering background. My undergraduate degree was in mechanical engineering, so I've always looked at things from a mechanical standpoint. And from my personal standpoint, as we began to get into shoulder arthroscopy, I felt it was important to do things that were mechanically sound. And in the case of the rotator cuff, we needed to restore the normal mechanics, which meant uh, balance, balancing the force couples. We could take a shoulder that was anatomically deficient and make it biomechanically sound, for example, by doing an arthroscopic partial rotator cuff uh, repair. This was our article in 1994 that showed clinical uh, results of uh, good results of partial repair and trying to explain why that worked. And to me, it seemed that the reason it worked, again, was a mechanical reason. In addition to having balanced force couples, we were creating a suspension bridge configuration here where the uh, margin of the rotator cuff was like the cable of a suspension bridge and it transmitted a distributed load toward the attachment points on each end of the cuff tear. This is purely a theory initially, but then several years later, it was proven in the Mayo Clinic Bioengineering Lab by Dr. Sean O'Driscoll and Kai Ann and their group. I started doing side-to-side -side repairs in the mid to late 1980s, before there were any suture anchors, before there was any reliable way to attach the tendon to bone. But uh, there weren't a lot of those type of tears, but the ones there were actually uh, came together very nicely. And so I had to think about why is it that these tears can come to together so nicely and converge toward bone? And that uh, was the genesis of this paper on margin convergence, a method of reducing strain in massive cuff tears. And uh, by this theory, if you look at it mathematically, if you close two-thirds of a tear side to side, you'll have a six-fold reduction in the strain at the converged margin of that tear. So that means that you have a dramatic protective effect simple by this simple mechanical uh, technique of doing side to side repair for a part of your tear. So it's going to make re-tear much less likely. This, uh, so, so I had an extreme interest in optimizing the strength of fixation <clears throat> in rotator cuff. We published more articles once uh, suture, suture anchors came into being about the best way to place the anchors. The dead man angle had this analogy with uh, a fence post on the South Texas ranch <clears throat> where this guy wire connected to a rock under the ground was my analogy to a suture anchor. Loop security, which had been totally ignored up to that point, I felt was as important as knot security. So you can have a very tight uh, knot um, here with a tight loop and you have a very secure repair in the upper left. But if you look to the right of that, you can have a very good knot but a loose loop and your cuff repair is going to fail. So we investigated this and determined the best way to achieve loop security. Knot security, of course, is also extremely important. You've got to have a base knot, we found, by tying thousands of knots in the lab. And then you uh, have to lock that with three reverse post stacked uh, half hitches. So you have to have all of these elements to have your best, uh, most stable repair. What about poor tendon quality? Well, we kept shifting the weak link from one element of the construct to another, and finally you end up shifting it to the tendon, which is going to be the poorest, weakest uh, tissue of all. And uh, more recently, then, we've developed this load-sharing ripstop technique, which is extremely good in uh, patients with poor quality tissue. And what you do here is to pass... Uh, inverted mattress fiber tapes, and then uh, typically these are going to be short tendons in older people with poor quality tissue. Then you'll tie your uh, sutures from your, what would have been your only single row of repair, bring them medial to the fiber tape, which acts as a ripstop, but then it shares the load because you're fixing it laterally with swivel lock anchors. So, to my mind, this is uh, the most uh, important development in rotator cuff is the linked self-reinforcing double row repair. And how did we get there? Um, and, and, and what's the advantage to it? If you look at it, this is a very unique type of repair because it is self-reinforcing. If you look at other industries like the automotive industry, there have been self-regulating parts, self-balancing parts for years, but Medicine and, and biology is not really known for any self-regulating mechanisms, and I, this is the first one I know of. If you think of trying to 
pull on a Chinese finger trap, the harder you pull, the tighter it becomes. So you improve the mechanics by trying to fail the system. And the reason I think this works with this uh, linked double row repair is if you look at the uh, configuration of this double row repair, it's uh, without load, it is a rectangle of fixation. When you put a tensile load on your, on your muscle tendon unit, this rectangle turns to a parallelogram, and two things happen when you do that. One is you increase the frictional forces by this relationship here. The other is that you wedge the tendon underneath your fiber tapes or your fiber wires so that the harder you pull, the tighter it becomes. So with all these things in mind, and probably 25 years ago, um, I met Ryan Holsch meeting, and we had very similar interests in developing shoulder arthroscopy and we both felt that it would have a great future. And the biggest challenge, of course, was to develop instrumentation and learning to build a ship in a bottle, basically. And you wanted to have just as good a ship inside the bottle as you would have had outside the bottle. Um, one of the first projects I did with Arthrex was this arthroscopic transosseous rotator cuff repair system, which was patented in 1993, but never became a product. Um, and it's interesting that now some people are talking about it as the latest new thing. But uh, I did about 20 of these cases in uh, the early to mid-90s. They worked pretty well, but the only reason they worked well is because we had an entry point into cortical bone. And to get there, you had to go below the axillary nerve. And we had to develop a specific portal for that. And I felt that that was too dangerous to recommend to my colleagues and that it would be best <clears throat> not to do these transosseous repairs. Um, so about that time, a little bit after that, we compared cyclic loading failures of bone tunnels with cyclic loading failures of anchor-based repairs. And to my surprise, I found that the anchor-based repairs were stronger than bone tunnels. Up until that point, I thought that bone tunnels would be the way to go. But what we found was not only were anchors stronger, but they shifted the weak link to the suture tendon interface. And that was a huge revelation to me. So I last talked about arthroscopic transosseous cuff repairs in 1995. You'll hear people talking about it today. These were the slides I used, and I used a machine like this. So if you hear someone telling you the superiority of it, you may want to just close your ears. There are some unique challenges to arthroscopic cuff repair. There's visualization, there's recognizing normal and abnormal anatomy, passing the sutures, tying the knots, avoiding loose knots. So in the early days, we had to confront each of these things one by one. What about visualization? Well, this depends on a lot of mechanical factors. All of this is mechanical when you think about it. You've got to control uh, the fluid mechanics, and you need to try to keep the patient's blood pressure below 100. The pump pressure, I typically have at 60. Some people use a lower pressure, but I've not had any problems starting at 60. And then I'll temporarily go up to 70 or 80 if need be. Turbulence control still remains an unrecognized or poorly recognized factor to my mind. And this occurs for a couple of reasons. First of all, in the subacromial space, true distension is not possible. It's not truly a closed space. Um, so if you're going to maintain a blood-free field, you've got to stop turbulence. If you have a, a portal that's leaking fluid like this one here, it, it creates a lot of turbulence. And the reason it does is because of the Bernoulli principle. The Bernoulli principle can be easily demonstrated by uh, the stream in the shower. And basically what it is is that the fluid stream causes a force perpendicular to the stream, and the magnitude of that force varies directly with the velocity of the fluid stream. So if you turn your shower on high and you have uh, a uh, thin shower curtain here, it's going to pull that shower curtain toward the stream. The higher the flow, the more it pulls it towards it. In much the same way, you have that same sort of force if you have an egress portal here with a lot of fluid going out is there's a force perpendicular to these capillaries that's just sucking blood out of the capillaries. And that's not good for visualization. And you get this blended flow pattern. It makes it impossible to see. So you've got to stop the turbulence. And the best way to do that is with digital pressure. So these two uh, photographs were taken probably two minutes apart. You see this egress of fluid here. Can't see. It's too bloody. And we're in the subacromial space. I just use digital press pressure for about two minutes. I don't change any pump pressure or anything and all of a sudden we can see very well. So I have my assistants using their fingers to, uh, to block this uh, egress fluid all the time. And then, of course, if you have a cannula there, that'll block it as well. 
I think some people still don't recognize the importance of the 70 degree scope, and I know in some parts of the world it's difficult to be able to use those, but I just want to tell you how that helped me an awful lot. It helps you to see the pathology, particularly anteriorly in the shoulder. This is a posterior viewing portal in right shoulder, same patient. And on the left, you see with the 30 degree scope, the subscap looks pretty normal. You'd be hard pressed to say there's much wrong with it. Biceps tend in the same way. But if you put a 70 degree scope in there and you look sort of down with this aerial view, you see there's a partial tear that may be significant on the subscap. At least you need to investigate it more. Perhaps some incompetence of the medial sling that you may need to investigate more. This is a video that I'll show looking anteriorly, first with a 30 degree scope and a right shoulder, and you see there's the biceps tendon. Uh, we'll see, get a glimpse of the subscap there in the front as well. And now we're going to switch to a 70 degree scope. We have this aerial view, and you see now we can see the subscap footprint quite well. You see its attachments over here. And then look down the bicipital groove now. Typically, you can see between two and two and a half centimeters down the bicipital groove. You can see if there's any pathology to worry about. You don't have to guess about it. You may want to do a tenodesis at the top of the groove. Why not? Because uh, everything looks like it's, um, it's pretty, pretty free there. So it can help you a lot. Some of the early challenges, too. What, what is normal? We weren't sure exactly what the uh, glenohumeral ligaments were supposed to look like if you hadn't cut through them first. Uh, what was a slap lesion? We didn't understand what that was. So uh, how do you visualize entire muscle tendon units? How, how can you debreed those so that without destroying them so that you can actually see? These were all questions early on. What about the anatomy? This was a, this was a uh, structure that I puzzled about for a while, this rotator cable crescent complex. Obviously, that had some mechanical reason to be designed that way. And we published this uh, paper in 1993 about the cable crescent complex. And so it seemed to me that the na normal anatomy was much like a suspension bridge. You have this cable-like structure that can support a distributed load. It has three main points that it uh, attaches to. It has two in the front, one is, is at the top of the subscap, one is at the anterior border of the supraspinatus, and the third one is at the inferior border of the infraspinatus. So my feeling is those are the most important fixation points. If you can't fix anything else, you need to fix those three fixation points so that you can end up with this suspension bridge type of configuration. And so typically, if I'm going to do, for example, a speed bridge repair, I'm going to reinforce with additional cinch loop sutures in front of that and in back of that. So I'm reinforcing the cables, and I think that's very important. Exposing the bony landmarks is important, particularly with massive tears. And with all the large and massive tears, for sure, I expose the scapular spine. And that helps me to define the raffe between the supra and the infraspinatus. Then I know exactly what I'm dealing with in terms of uh, the tear configuration. So this is a right shoulder. I'm looking through a posterior lateral viewing portal. You see the raffe between the supra and infraspinatus. And I can follow this laterally and see that this tear involves all the supraspinatus and about half the infraspinatus. Then I have to manip manipulate that tear and see if it's a crescent tear or is it uh, an L tear. How do, I, how do I manage this tear? Because the, the repair pattern is the tear pattern. You've got to know what the tear pattern is. So I'll get a grasper. There's a kingfisher coming in, and I'll find what I think is the corner of a reverse L, because I'm thinking the way this looks, it's probably a reverse L tear, and sure enough, there's the corner. You see how that's going to fit down nicely there, and then this would overlap like the, the infraspinatus does over the top of that, and that'll allow you then to place your medial anchors appropriately and place your sutures appropriately. Now remember, place the sutures about two or three millimeters lateral to the muscle tendon junction. This is a fast pass scorpion. You want to go two to three millimeters lateral to the muscle tendon junction so you don't create a stress riser at the muscle tendon junction. And then you can end up with, if you're doing, for example, a suture bridge, even an extended suture bridge, diamond back repair with something like this. Passing the sutures, that was an early challenge. And you had two choices, retrograde and antegrade. And the thing that people don't uh, recognize is that early on, back in the 1980s, early 90s, the machinists couldn't make complex patterns. Everything had to be straight or just some variation with a little angle to it. You couldn't make these curved instruments. So these hook-type retrievers were about all that we had to work with with retrograde passage. This was one of our early hook retrievers from Arthrex here. So early it doesn't really have a name. I called it the hooker. 
But uh, you can see uh, it has that little, uh, it's spring-loaded and pushes that uh, point out that'll then capture the suture. And this was one that we used with our transosseous repair set. Same type of idea, it just was longer in order to be able to go through the transosseous holes. Then we had second generation retrograde passers. We had the suture lasso, uh, we, there's the banana lasso that was uh, Olivier uh, Courage's uh, adaptation of the, uh, of the lasso. And then we had other uh, passers, the bird beaks, the penetrators, and these helped a great deal with our ability to pass sutures. This is the current uh, generation of penetrator, which is, makes it easier to pass several sutures or even a retrograde pass of fiber tape because you see that it has this radius post on the lower jaw so that you have less friction when you go to pass, uh, when you grab the suture and it pulls out. The thing I didn't like particularly about oblique, about retrograde suture passage was that it required an oblique angle of approach most of the time, not all the time, but particularly for supraspinatus, you'd have to go through a modified Neviaster portal, as you see on the left, and then uh, your sutures would have to be passed at an angle. So this shows it diagrammatically in the left-hand frame. You see we are approaching it at an angle. So you end up with a different length tension relationship at the top of the cuff than you do at the bottom of the cuff. And you get this tension mismatch that I thought might be not so good mechanically. So the next step then was to eliminate that tension mismatch with anti-grade suture passes. And you see now you end up two or three millimeters lateral from the muscle tendon junction. You're going perfectly perpendicular to the muscle tendon units. And to me, from a mechanical standpoint, that's much, uh, much more preferable. And so the first of these that Arthrex had that I was involved with was the uh, Arthrex uh, Viper. And uh, that was a huge advancement in my mind. It made me able to repair these tears much more quickly. But it had uh, a little quirk to it that you had to sort of roll that um, the body of your passer in order to not lose the suture as you passed it through. And that was because you actually had to pull the suture through the tendon rather than pushing it through. The next development was the Scorpion. This was an early Scorpion prototype that we had. And uh, just to show you how that worked, it had this plunger on the end that was spring-loaded that would push a nitinol pin up through. And the idea was that that nitinol pin would push, on this, see in this right frame, it would push the suture through the tendon just as it does today, except the design changed, obviously. And this was the first generation Scorpion where the needle actually partially penetrated through the, the uh, suture. And then now that has developed into this uh, Scorpion Fast Pass, which I think is uh, a, a really wonderful suture passing device that has a self-capturing trap door on the upper jaw and allows you to pass this with one hand, one motion, without an assistant. Tying the knots was initially a problem. When I, when I was starting to try to tie knots for the transosseous repairs, the problem was I was trying to tie over bone, and it was very difficult to hold a tight loop. So I thought we had to have some sort of device that would hold pressure on the, the first throw, like a child holding his finger on a shoelace. And so I came up with this idea, and this was the first prototype. The Arthrex uh, engineers gave this to me later, along with, uh, but, but basically I bought some copper tubing and a little piece of uh, plastic to go over it, and it would push a half hitch down at a time. And then within three weeks, this is how Arthrex could respond. Within three weeks, we had this prototype on the bottom, and the design of it hasn't changed over the years. And that was about the time, too, that Arthrex began to use some very uh, nice advertising. And a lot of this came from Reinhold Schmieding, the president who has a real knack for naming instruments and for using these slogans. If you look here, don't fish around for solutions to arthros arthroscopic knot tying. And then it's because we were using this fishbowl cannula and fish swimming around it, of course, and then the six-finger knot pusher, not seeing is believing. Very catchy phrase. The sutures improved. This was a great uh, paradigm shift in, uh, in doing arthroscopic repairs. High strength fiber wire. You didn't have to worry about, tear, about uh, rupturing the suture every time you tied a knot. And uh, this was an apparatus we used early on for testing the abrasion, which was, uh, also resulted in an article in the Arthroscopy Journal about the benefits of fiber wire. And you see this is Ethabon on the right, and you see how much stronger it is at every degree of testing for the abrasion. The first generation BioCork screw, these began with PLA materials. Uh, the first, it had this very uh, ingenious uh, eyelet here. There was a flexible eyelet uh, 
um, that was uh, insert molded down into the body of the anchor. And then that fairly rapidly yielded to the fully threaded design, which had much greater pullout strength. And uh, the ones that we use today still have that threaded eyelet down within the body, but uh, the pullout strengths are incredibly better, and, and osteoporotic bone is not much of a problem yet anymore. Our initial um, attempts at doing double row repairs, which I thought was the anatomic way, looked like this one on the left. It was unlinked. And uh, then there was, a, I think, a landmark study done from the group at Curl and Job with Max Park, Jim Taboni, Neil Elitrash, Ty Lee, where they looked at the suture bridge where you link the medial and lateral rows together. And that dramatically improved the, the uh, contact area and also the ultimate strength of the fixation construct. But then that wasn't enough. We wanted to improve that even more. We needed to have knotless fixation, larger compressive interface, improved anchor fixation. And, and to me, the knotless uh, fixation was sort of the holy grail in a way. And from a personal standpoint, uh, I can take this back to 1998 when I first realized how important um, knotless fixation could be with this twist lock fixation con uh, concept that I'll talk to you about. So I thought the holy grail of tissue fixation would be tissue transport to an anchor with selective tensioning, secure fixation without knots, and easy to use. So in 1998, my host in Hong Kong was Dr. James Lam. Here we were the first day that we had lunch together at the Hong Kong Yacht Club. Uh, I didn't know what would be awaiting us the next day, and uh, certainly I think it emphasizes that nothing is entirely new and that inspiration favors the prepared observer. So the next day we had lunch on Queens Road in Hong Kong, and um, I'll tell you in a bit uh, about how that influenced the way I looked at knots, but first I want to give you a brief history of knots. Did you know that animals can tie knots? Not every surgeon can tie knots, but gorillas can tie granny knots and square knots, and they hold saplings in their nests by means of these knots. Weaver birds use knots in their nests. The hagfish is a primitive fish that ties itself into an overhand knot. This is a hagfish, and you see how it just ties itself when it's threatened into an overhand knot. So uh, any of us that, that can't uh, tie a knot might want to consider observing the hagfish. If you go back in history, to the prehistoric people nine, 10,000 years ago, that um, they had these primitive spear points that they held onto the uh, shafts of their spears with lashings, not knots. If you look, uh, all of the archaeological evidence is that they had lashings, not knots, and uh, lashing security was obviously very important if you're hunting a mammoth. The biblical fishermen, they had to have tight knots or they were going to lose the fish that they caught. Phoenician sailors, they were the kings of trade around the world. They had to have riggings that were going to be reliable. They had to have good knots. The Gordian knot in Asia Minor was very famous because the legend was that the man who could untie the Gordian knot would rule Asia. So Alexander the Great heard of it. He went there, tried to untie the knot, couldn't do it, so he used his sword to cut the knot and proclaimed himself the ruler of Asia. So simple solutions are always best, whether it's in uh, the ruling of Asia or whether it's in shoulder arthroscopy. On the western frontier of the United States, knots were very handy. Uh, they were handy in uh, dealing with unruly livestock. They were handy in dealing with unruly humans. But what is a knot? If you go to Webster's Dictionary, they say it's an interlacing, twining, looping, etc., of a cord, rope, or the like, drawn tight into a knob or a lump for fastening, binding, connecting two cords together, or a cord to something else. Well, I'm not sure I know what a knot is from reading that, but then you look up what is a lashing, and they say it's a binding or a fastening with a rope or the like. But if you go back and forth between those two definitions, they're almost identical. So a lashing and a knot, um, the differences are differences of degree only because they both incorporate friction, they incorporate internal interference, and they usually fail by slippage rather than breakage. So what would we call it if we could secure suture limbs without a knot? And would it be as good as a knot? So this is the secret of the Hong Kong skyscrapers. This was the view that we had from our outdoor dining terrace on Queens Road of a building that was undergoing renovations across the street. And uh, Dr. Lamb pointed out to me that this scaffolding was bamboo and it was all held together by lashings. In fact, at that time, they built even the 100-story Bank of China 
completely using uh, bamboo scaffoldings 100 stories up. So lashings had to be good. So I took this picture on that day to see what lashings looked like. They were these leather or fabric uh, strips that wrapped between the two poles and turned back on themselves. There wasn't a single knot in it, and these were extremely secure. So this led to a concept that uh, we almost became a product, the twist lock concept with Arthrex. And the idea was it would have a, an eyelet on the leading end, and you would bring uh, the, the knots through the leading end, and you would have some internal interference there, and you'd get what you call cable friction there as well. And so this is basically how it would work, and it's very similar to a push lock type of thing, uh, except with different uh, insertion techniques. And you'd do some twists to get, increase your internal interference, and you'd end up with something like that. I did about 20 of these cases. We uh, actually got this FDA approved. And you see I'm using Ethabond here, that old green Ethabond suture. And the problem was that this would unpredictably break, not all the time, but in some patients. And uh, so it never was ideal. But the reason that this concept worked is cable friction and the wedge effect. Again, this is another lesson from the ranch. Uh, you can see that I'm a very chauvinistic Texan here. But if you try to uh, control a horse with a lead rope, the, the horse is going to win every time. You can't, he has much too much strength for us to control. But if you can find a post, they call it, the cowboys call it a snubbing post, to wrap that rope around, then you can control the horse. And he's going to be totally docile, and he'll do what you want him to do. This is a little better picture of it. You see the cowboy has three wraps uh, around that post. And so now he can control this much stronger animal. So uh, we did testing on this, and basically what we found, we compared it to the old metal cork screws, and we found that the twist lock with this interference fit had a higher load to failure. It was 12% stronger, even using Ethabon suture. So the concept seemed good, but it needed one thing. It needed a better suture, and that's when fiber wire came along. And then shortly after that, fiber tape. This was a knotless cuff repair that I did in February 2000 using um, a knotless uh, suture against an ACL screw. This is not a shoulder anchor at all. It was an ACL screw, and I put the Ethabon suture through and actually got quite good fixation. So I was becoming more and more enthusiastic about knotless fixation. But the problem was if you took Ethabon suture, which was prone to break, and tried to position it at the bottom of this hole, you had to basically drag it into that hole and it created a lot of friction and abrasion against the suture, and that's where it would break. So this was a, a drawing of mine back in 2000, of not how I would envision we would do it with an extended inserter through the uh, anchor and going in, so that it would push the suture down to the bottom of that hole, and then you'd put your anchor in. You can see that's basically how the, the push lock works with an eyelet on the end of it. And so that led to the evolution of push lock and then later swivel lock with a screw-in type anchor. The swivel lock evolved a little bit differently, and, and once again, let's go back to the ranch. Ranches are very important, as I can prove to you here today. But uh, the cowboy's method of knotless fixation, they use ropes, of course, but uh, they also use chains when they close a gate, and you can choose an individual link in the chain, and you can make the fixation as tight or as loose as you want it to be. So we developed this fiber chain with Arthrex initially, that uh, we use with this uh, instrument or with this, this implant swivel lock. And if you notice here, the swivel lock, the first swivel lock had a fork on it. And the idea was that fork would capture the appropriate link of the fiber chain and then drive it into the bone and you'd have a knotless fixation. It was very secure. The problem with this technique is it was a little difficult to capture that link and we needed something easier. And that came in the form then of fiber tape. And once we had fiber tape, and, uh, and uh, it became obvious we needed a closed link, or I'm sorry, a closed eyelet in the swivel lock so that you didn't have to capture a link. And then that led to the speed bridge, which is uh, just an incredibly uh, good and, and important uh, structure for, or construct for repairing rotator cuff. Um, so this is my preferred technique now is with uh, the speed bridge knotless technique. And I try to reinforce with these cinch loops in front of and in back of the grid that is formed by the, by the uh, fiber tape. And if the tissue is of questionable quality, you have these um, additional sutures that are safety sutures in your medial anchors that you can then use to do a uh, 
what I call a double pulley technique, to have a double mattress between these two medial anchors. So this, I think, is today's gold standard. This is what I use on my crescent-shaped tears. And you can end up with this type of a, of a construct at the end of your case if you have a crescent tear. Of course, they're not all crescent tears. You have to recognize that. And they don't all have good tissue. I mentioned earlier that if tissue is deficient, you may want to uh, consider this uh, load-sharing ripstop. And again, uh, just to point out, it's an inverted mattress fiber tape that uh, is sharing the load by uh, uh, being attached laterally. And then it also serves as a ripstop for these uh, sutures that you may want to tie over the top of it, pass medial to that uh, ripstop. And if I have more than one tendon involved, I'll use a separate load-sharing ripstop for each tendon, so you have a situation like this. What about results of today's linked double row cuff repairs? And I'll just tell you, they're outstanding. If you look at, uh, from Curl and Job again, Neil Elitrash had uh, a um, paper in the AGSM in 2008, 25 patients. This included massive cuff tears, 88% radiographic healing rate after 12 months. Uh, Bruno Toussaint here in France, uh, his paper in 2012, 86% radiographic healing rate after 12 months. So um, the suture bridge is getting good results. And then, of course, by extension, uh, Peter Millet and others have written of their results of the speed bridge and uh, very similar results. This is uh, a paper that we published two years ago in the Arthroscopy Journal on massive cuff uh, tear repair. We had a mean follow-up of 8.2 years, so long-term follow-up. And on these massive tears, we had good or excellent results in 78% of patients. 91% of patients were satisfied. Interestingly enough, when you look at double row versus single row repair in these massive tears, the double row repairs were 4.9 times more likely to lead to good or excellent functional outcomes than the single row. So, you know, if you have good enough tissue and a long enough tendon to get a double row in a massive tear, that's probably even the, the best indication for doing double row repair. What about this ugliest of cuff tears, the pseudoparalysis, where they can't even raise their arm? Well, again, we had a, a cohort of patients with six-year follow-up. We had 39 patients. 90% of these regained overhead motion greater than 90 degrees. We had only one reoperation. The patients reported their shoulder felt 82% of normal. So even these can be uh, extremely worthwhile to do. And I think it's something certainly to remember in these days when uh, some people are thinking that uh, the reverse prosthesis is the only way to treat something like that because I can guarantee you it's not. So what about the future? Well, we're looking at the convergence of all sorts of new technologies now. And it's really very exciting. There's biologic enhancement that's already begun. And Arthrex, I think, is leading the way with that with biocomposite anchors that are vented, and these vents uh, allow bone ingrowth through the vents, and they allow the marrow elements to come up to the bone tendon interface. Uh, we've talked about the self-reinforcement, so anytime you do a bridging double row technique, you're going to have that uh, biologic enhancement of self-reinforcement. Scaffolds, if you uh, have poor tissue, you might, in some cases, consider augmenting your cup repair with a dermal allograft. Uh, certainly, there are going to be ways to, uh, uh, varying ways to uh, uh, put uh, growth factors at the bone tendon interface in the future. Right now, platelet rich plasma, or the Arthrex ACP, is uh, a good adjunct uh, for that, too. There are stem cell technologies, some of which um, are developed more than others, but this induced pluripotent stem cell is something that can generate along certain um, predetermined. Uh, cell, cell lines and is something that I think in the future we'll be able to inject these uh, cells from the patient's own DNA that will allow more predictable healing. Um, cell therapies, RNA interference interferes with the messenger RNA and it has uh, anti-cancer and anti-degenerative uh, implications. For example, with cancer, it shuts off the protein production uh, at, the, at the gene level. So you can actually turn off the gene that's responsible for vascular networks that help cancer cells to grow. So you could influence uh, cancer cells that way. You could also turn off the genes responsible for rotator cuff degeneration or arthritis of a various joint. Uh, those are all things that are probably going to be in our future. Nanotechnology, you know, a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. So when you're talking about nanotechnology, you're talking about the 25 to 45 
um, uh, nanometer uh, range. And so this is where nanotechnology and biotechnology can, um, can converge. Louis Pasteur said the role of the infinitely small is infinitely large. And when I talk about the convergence of uh, biology and biotechnology with nanotechnology, there are actually some uh, nano pills that have been devised that are so small in that uh, 25 to 45 nanometer range where they uh, can penetrate cell walls and they can go to targeted organelles within the cell. So you're talking about intracellular targeted treatments. Ray Kurzweil, in this book, The Singularity is Near, has postulated a future where we have nan uh, nanoscale robots or nanobots that can do surveillance in our bloodstream and can do cellular repairs and uh, can uh, remove toxins from our bloodstream. And who knows if that might be possible, but there are people that are thinking in that direction. This is something we have today in an area called Medware. This is a bio stamp. It's a skin patch that monitors data from deeper tissue. So just imagine that you've done a rotator cuff repair on someone and you want to monitor the healing of that cuff. Well, you can do that and then perhaps have an ACP pump that will know, okay, the cuff is at this stage, it needs another burst of ACP. There are all sorts of potential things out there that I think is going to guarantee that this is going to be an exciting future. And as Yogi Berra, the uh, famous American baseball player said, the future ain't what it used to be. So what's next at Arthrex? This is a picture from our ranch of a dragonfly riding on top of this poisonous snake, the cottonmouth, and he's just out of reach where uh, the snake couldn't possibly harm him. And this is the Arthrex dragonfly. Just a very coincidental, we were able to get this uh, snapshot, but uh, the symbol of Arthrex technology that you see. So Arthrex is not afraid to do big, scary things. And the big things often are scary, but you can't be afraid of them. Like I said, uh, you've got to buck the establishment if need be. And if you're doing the right thing, it's going to turn out just fine. So I sort of compare Arthrex to the Pentagon. There's a lot of new stuff going on, secret uh, developments on new devices. And I wish I could tell you what some of these were, but you know, it's top secret. And it's going to be virtually impossible for you to find out ahead of time what these are because there are some very capable guardians of those secrets at Arthrex. This is a picture of Ryan Olschmidi and me after we'd done some target practice on some some clay pigeons at uh, my ranch, but that's top secret. So there are those disruptive technologies out there. They're coming, they're inevitable, they're not kind, but they can be very exciting. You have to ask yourself, are you ready for them? Well, I know that Arthrex is ready, I'm ready, and I hope that you're ready. So let's light this candle. Thank you. <laughs>